Hi, this is lesson 1.3, solving equations with variables on both sides. You should be on page 20. You're going to learn the following day how to solve a linear equation that has variables on both sides of it, how to identify special solutions of linear equations, and how to use linear equations to solve real life problems. When you solve equations with variables on both sides, there's an order that we have to do it in. So I'm going to kind of mark these right now. The first step is to simplify one or both sides of the equation if necessary. That's step one. Step two. Use inverse operations to collect the variable terms on one side. That's step two. Step three is then to collect the constant terms on the other side and isolate the variable. So that verb when we verbalize it that way, it might seem more complicated than it really is. Let's do these two and walk through those steps together right now. So let's look at this. We're solving an equation that has variables on each side. So the first thing is try to simplify each side. Well, 10 minus 4x, I can't simplify. They're not alike. And negative 9x, I can't simplify. It's nothing to do with it. Okay, so we did step one. We tried to simplify. Step two, get all the variables on one side. So if I quickly, let me just write the problem here. If I quickly add 4x to each side, do you notice how I have constants on the left and variable on the right? Well, this should now be easy to isolate the variable and solve, which is step three of the process I just had you write down. Divide each side by negative 5 x equals negative 2, and then we can check our answer. If I plug a negative 2 in here and a negative 2 in here, am I getting the same thing on each side? You can see in the book they did check it, and they're getting that 18 equals 18. It checks out. Okay? Let's go to example 2. Let me write it down real quick. Okay, so step 1, simplify each side if we can. Well, we can. We've got to distribute here. So on the left, we get 9x minus 12. And on the right, when I distribute, a quarter times 32x would be 8x. And one quarter of 56 is 14. Okay, now next, the second step. Get all the variables on one side, which this kind of bothers me when I look at the book right now. They didn't even follow their own directions. They're not getting all the variables on one side like they said they should be in part two. So let's do it correctly. Let's move all the variables to one side. Let's take away 8x from each side. So the 8x is cancel, and now you have 1x minus 12 equals 14. Well, this should be easy now. We just have to isolate the variables. So this is where the onion comes in. We've done that earlier. Let's add 12 to each side. So 1x would equal 26, and I can divide by 1, and x is 26. And then, of course, I can check it to make sure I'm doing it correctly. In this case, if I plug in 26, I am getting a true statement. What I'd like you to do is try. Why don't you try right now question 1 and question 3? Pause the video and do that now. Okay, I'm back. So on this first question, I try to simplify each side. 3x plus 10, I can't add those together. And negative 2x, there's nothing I can do. Step 2, let's get all the variables on one side. So I took away 3x from each side. And I have negative 5x on the left and 10 on the right. And then to get x by itself, divide each side by negative 5. And you see I'm getting x equals negative 2. And when I check it, it's working. I get 4 here. And over here, I get negative 6 plus 10, and that equals 4. Let's go to 3. You've got to try to simplify first, and you can. You've got to distribute on the left. 
I get negative 6n minus 9 on the left, and then distribute on the right, that's 3n minus 9. Now, let's get all the variables on one side. So I took away 3n from each side to get rid of the positive 3n. So negative 9n minus 9 would equal negative 9. Now I've got to get the variable by itself, so I added 9 to each side to get rid of the minus 9, and that gives me negative 9 on the left, 0 on the right, and then divide by negative 9 and n is 0. Now when I check that, if I put a 0 here, I get negative 3 quarter times 12, that's negative 9, and if I put a 0 in here, I get 3 times negative 3, which is negative 9, and those equal, so this is definitely correct. Now, when you have equations that have variables on each side, it is possible that those equations will not always have one solution. So you might want to pause the video and write that down right now. If an equation has variables on each side, it might not just have one solution. It could be true for all values of the variable, and that's called identity. It has infinitely many solutions. Or the equation could not be true and have no solution. So the only time this special situation, notice how they have special there. The only time this special situation can pop up is if the problem starts with variables on each side. So when you look at the last two questions we did, do you notice how we had variables on each side of the problem? That's when it is possible that we might not just get one answer. Now, in these two practice questions, we did get one answer. But it's possible it might not work out that way. So here would be some examples of that. Like, let's look at this. I'm going to write the problem down. We have 3, 5x plus 2 equals 15x. Well, step one, simplify. We'll distribute 15x plus 6 equals 15x. Okay, let's get all the variables on one side. So I'll take away 15x here, which will cancel that out, 6 on the left. And I'll take away 15x here, and oh, look what happens. All the variables disappear, and I get a statement. Now, let's look at the statement. Does that make sense? Does 6 equal 0? And it doesn't make sense. So that means that this problem that we did has no solution to it. Okay, that would be a no solution. That would be the situation that I'm referring to in pink right now as no solution. Here's another example. We have an equation. We have to distribute first. Remember, we always simplify if we can. So we get negative 8y minus 2 equals negative 8y minus 2. Okay, I don't want negative 8y over here, so I'm going to add 8y to each side. Look what happens. My variables cancel here, and I get negative 2. My variables also cancel here, and I get negative 2. Do you notice how I'm getting a true statement? This is the situation in blue. This problem is called identity. It has infinitely many solutions. It means I could plug in any number I want and I'm going to get a true statement. Like, I'll prove it to you. Let's pick 5. If I put 5 here, I get negative 2 times 4 times 5 is 20 plus 1. This is negative 2 times 21. That's negative 42. Now I'll go over here and plug in 5. Negative 8 times 5 is negative 40, and if I take away 2, I get negative 42 again. See, I can pick any number I want, plug it in, and I'll get a true statement. That's what this means by identity. I can plug in any number. I have infinitely many solutions to that. Let's have you try a few of these. Pause the video, and why don't you try number 4, 5, and 6. Okay, I'm back. So for number four, we have to simplify each side first. If we can, I can simplify here by distributing. That gives me four minus four p equals negative four p plus four. Step two, I see variables on each side. I got to get them all to one side. So I decided right here where I'm pointing, I don't want the negative four p there. I'll add four p, which cancels these. 
Now, if I cancel these and I add 4P over here, well, look what happens. Negative 4P plus 4P cancels also, and I'm left with 4 on the left equals 4 on the right. That's true. This is identity, and I put IMS, which means infinitely many solutions, okay? This problem has infinitely many solutions. Let's go to the next one, 5. Okay, I wrote the problem down. I got to simplify each side. So 6m minus 1m is 5m. And when I distribute over here, I got 5m minus, well, 5, 6 times 10 is 56. Okay, which actually I should reduce that. Let's make 56. That would be 25 thirds. Okay. Then I don't want 5m over here. I got to get it away from the constant. So I took away 5m and look what happens. They cancel here and they cancel here. And I have 0 on the left equaling 25 thirds, negative 25 thirds on the right. Is that true? Does 0 equal negative 25 thirds? And no, it doesn't. This problem would have no solution to it. And that's no solution. And then number 6. I wrote the problem down. I tried to simplify. I can't add those together, and these don't subtract because they're not alike. But I see variables on each side. Let's get all the variables to one side. So I added 10K to each side, so these cancel. I have 20K on the left plus 7 equals negative 3. I can take away the 7. That gives me 20K equals negative 10. I got to get K by itself, so I'm dividing by 20. And I'm getting, that's a mistake, I didn't write that right. Negative 10 divided by 20 is negative half. I had a mental mistake there. There we go, k equals negative a half, and then I should check it, okay? That just shows you I didn't check my answer. It couldn't have been negative 2. Let's check it real quick. 10 times negative half is negative 5, and negative 5 plus 7 is positive 2, so I get a positive 2 on the left. And on the right, I have negative 3 minus, okay, 10 times negative half is negative 5, and then negative 3 minus negative 5, we're adding the opposite, turns into negative 3 plus 5, and that gives me 2 again. So this is checking now. That is correct. So here are the general steps to solving a linear equation. I'm just repeating myself again, but I think it's important to do it. Step 1. And I did both of these. The book put two steps. I'm just going to call this one big step right here. You need to simplify if you can on each side. That includes using the distributive property to remove grouping simple symbols and also combining like terms. So this is really, they put two steps in the book. I would consider that one step. Simplify each side of the equation. The next step. Get all your variables on one side. That's the next step. After you're done with that, then get the constants on the other side, which gets you to the final part, isolate the variable, which means solve the problem, and then you should check it at the end, okay? Solving real life problems. A boat leaves New Orleans and travels upstream on the Mississippi River for four hours. The return trip only takes 2.8 hours because the boat travels 3 miles per hour faster downstream due to the current. How far does the boat travel upstream? You get problems like this, I would highly recommend drawing a picture. So I'm going to pause the video quick and draw a picture. Okay, so this picture isn't any great work of art, but let's think for a minute. The boat travels, and I have an arrow here, in this direction, it says upstream. So it's going from this point A to point B. The time was four hours, and the speed, they don't tell me the speed. Well, okay, that's easy. It's an unknown. It's X. Now, the boat turns around. There's a return trip. It turns around, and now it's going in the opposite direction. It's going this way. You notice the time. It took less time because it's going with the water. Now, we don't know how fast the boat was traveling, but it said it traveled three miles per hour faster. So I left this blank, the speed, what is it? Well, if the speed there was X, and on the way back it's three miles per hour faster, that means this has to be X plus three. Now, 
I know you've heard of this before. I don't know that we've officially talked about it in class as of yet, but this is a distance equals rate times time problem. Distance always equals rate and time. Now look at the picture. There's something about this picture we know that's equal. Can you see it? The trip there has the same distance as the trip back. So let me write that down. Distance there equals distance back. If you can get this on paper, you're 90% there to getting it right. Okay, now, the distance there, does it make sense that distance is the same as rate times time? So instead of distance, the rate and time there should equal the rate and time back. Well, let's look. What was the rate and time there? I have it, I have it here on my video. The time was four hours and the rate was X. So the rate and time there would be 4X. 4 for time, X for rate. On the way back, the time was 2.8 and the rate was X plus 3. So 2.8 times X plus 3 would be the rate back. Now, if you get to here, you can see I'm matching what the book has. All you have to do is, is simplify first, distribute. You can see that here. Get all the variables on one side, which you can see the book's doing here. We're taking away 2.8x, so 1.2x equals 8.4. Divide by 1.2, and there's your answer. It was it, the rate of the boat we're looking for. I'm sorry, I misspoke. The distance the boat traveled would have been 7 miles, okay? seven mile trip upstream then. Um, I just misspoke. I'm back. I just had to collect my thoughts for a minute. We have X equals seven. I said seven miles. That's not true. So let, let's think for a minute. I was talking faster than thinking. The speed was seven miles per hour upstream. So if I'm traveling seven miles per hour for four hours, seven miles per hour times four hours means I travel or the boat traveled 28 miles, okay? So again, I'm the teacher and sometimes I get ahead of myself just like you do too. I was so excited I got X figured out, I didn't even think about the unit. So my trip, it was a seven mile per hour trip but that doesn't tell me the distance. The question was, what was the distance? The distance was 28 miles. Okay, I'm going to pause the video there. If you have questions, make sure you ask in class.